We're in class number 15 in our series, Hypostatic Union. Again, it's a very fancy word, it sounds very big, but really it just means the, the foundational undergirding um, principle which we build our, our Christian faith on. And it's a very important doctrine, it's a very important issue, because the very foundational uh, a doctrine that we build our Christian faith on is that God became flesh, that God came down and became a man uh, to redeem and win man back to himself. So um, that's that's what this uh, hypostatic union is. It's this doctrine of uh, the unique individual of the universe, the God-man, Jesus the Christ. And so we took this up, as I said, some 15 weeks ago, and um we got into this particular series talking about this union where Job, in his frustration, cried out in the ninth chapter, um, I, I wish I could talk to God. I mean, God's up there, I'm down here. I wish I could have somebody that would be a go-between, somebody who would be able to put their hand on my shoulder, being a man, and represent me to God, and somebody who would be able to put their hand on God's shoulder and represent God to me. And uh, he needed a referee, an umpire, a days man, a go-between, an arbitrator. And um, we took this whole issue up, how that God himself made that choice to come and be that go-between. God became, Jesus became the mediator between God and man. And uh, this is what we call the hypostatic union. And so we talked about this for many weeks, and we brought this up. And so if you go back in the series and you know, catch a hold of, of those concepts and those principles. And I strongly encourage you to go back and listen to it, not just once, but listen to it again and again. And these are fundamental truths, and they're necessary that we grab a hold of them and, uh, and understand them fully and, and believe in them. It is the foundational principle of the Christian message, the Christian doctrine. And so, uh, for example, you know, we're coming up to Christmas next week, and we hear this uh, many, many times, Isaiah 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. This concept here, unto us a child is born, this is speaking to his uh, physiology. Uh, this God-man had to have a physical body. But unto us a son is given. This is the second member of the Godhead. And of course we get these two infused in one person, Jesus the Christ or Christ Jesus. And we took this up also in First Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. For without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. And here's this mystery. Here's this, this uh, awesomeness that we've we got to get our head around. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. And again, this God being manifest in flesh. I mean, it's phenomenal truth. Um, you know, many of the religions in the world, as I've said before, always try to uh, cause man to become so good to elevate or exalt himself uh, to the position of God. So the better you get or the more superior you get, the more advanced you become, the closer to God you get to be. And most men, when they when they create their religion or their doctrine or their belief, that's the philosophy that they have. We are trying to be like God. We are trying to a, 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 we're trying to develop to be like God. That would be man's perception of of doctrine. But this is the the mystery that God would want to come down and be with us. That's that's phenomenal. That God would. I mean, only God could come up with a doctrine like that anyway. Man wouldn't have thought that up. And then here's this other one too, in Philippians 2 and verse 5. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. And here's what it says about him. Who, being in the form of God, he thought it not robbery. He didn't think that by, by laying aside or stepping down to earth from there was going to be a disadvantage. He actually came down here with the intent of doing something. So for him to do it, he didn't think he was robbed of his position to come down here and help man. So it says, who being in the form of God, he thought it not robbery to be equal, sorry, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of his servant, and was made in the likeness of man. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And again, here we see Jesus uh, laying aside 
uh, temporarily uh, stepping down from his position, not from his deity. He was always 100% God and always 100% man. But nonetheless, he, w- he was willing to step down from glory and step into humanity for the purpose of redemption, redeeming us back to our Heavenly Father. So the reason he came and the reason all of this happened was because of man's sin issue. And we took this up a few weeks ago too in, in Genesis 2.17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat, for in the day that thou eatest thereof you will surely die. And this is what God had instructed Adam in the garden when there was only God and Adam. And he told Adam, you know, if if you disobey me, if you rebel against my, in, my, my, my command, and there was only one command, there wasn't ten or just one, just don't eat of this. And he said, but if you do, the day you do, you will surely die. And the word there is die, die. The word surely is the word die as well. So he says, in the day that you eat this thereof, you will die, die. Now we know when Adam ate, ate of the fruit, he didn't die there, there and then. In fact, it took another 930 years for Adam to physically die. But God wasn't lying when he said, in the day you eat thereof, you'll die, because Adam spiritually died. And we talked about how the death is not a cessation, but a separation. And so man was separated from his source like a a bush from the soil. And the minute you separate from it, although it still looks alive, though the roses still look like they're blossoming and blooming, they're literally dying. It may take a while for that to appear, but nonetheless, those roses, when you cut them from the bush and put them in a vase, you think they look beautiful and wonderful, but give them a week or two and, and then they'll die. So the minute you separate them from their source, they're automatically dying. And that's what happened to Adam. He got disconnected because of his rebellion. And that disconnection, that separation, that death, separation from his source, God, and it caused him to be separated spiritually and it caused him later on to suffer the consequence of that physically in physical death. And so man had a sin is his problem and sins are the symptoms. And we took this whole issue up about how the... Um, Sin is the issue. It's a sin issue. It's a spiritual issue. But the outworking of that separation, that that sin against God, singular, that rebellion against God, is acts of sin. Uh, we start to become um, fleshly uh, minded, fleshly oriented, uh, governed by what we feel, what we smell, what we taste, what we what we hear, and so on and so forth. And uh, so we become selfish and, and greedy and uh, all sorts. I mean, we just get led by our flesh. And so uh, the sin problem uh, leads to sins as a symptom. Uh, and so we started to talk about uh, Jesus coming to deal with the sin issue. Uh, if you deal with the sin issue, reconnecting us to God, then the sins issue will work itself out. But it's, it's really a sin issue. And that one sin is rejection of uh, God's salvation. So let me me move on. I'm I'm recapping too much here. Uh, In the Old Testament, we took this up over the last few weeks, this Old Testament reality. Now again, the Old Testament saints didn't know much about what happened when a person died. They just thought that the body went to the grave and then their, their physical or their spirit went in underneath the earth somewhere. But they didn't know where. So they called it just Sheol. Um, but when Jesus came along, he, he told a, 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 a story on, about the rich man and Lazarus, and he started to talk to us about the underworld. And then Peter and Jude later on give us some more details in the epistles. And so here's actually what was happening in the Old Testament. This really was the reality. Man's physiology went to the grave, but man's human spirit went down to this place underneath called Sheol, or Hades in the Greek. Um, and if you were an unbeliever or you didn't believe in God or didn't accept God's plan of salvation, whether that be trusting in the law and the coming Messiah by faith or in the New Testament looking back uh, to, to trusting in God, if you didn't trust in God, you ended up in Shoal or Hades where you waited um, until the redemption price was paid. And if you were a believer in the Old Testament and you believed on the coming Messiah, believed uh, in the word of God and, and the principles of God, when you died, your body went to the grave, but your spirit went to this upper region called Abraham's bosom. And uh, we took up that whole story and we, we dealt with that. Then a few weeks ago, we dealt with this place underneath the earth called Tartarus, this place for fallen angels. 
And these were angels that sinned and left their first estate. And we took up that whole issue a few weeks ago. And so if you want to go back and look at that. And then last week we took up this particular arena called the abyss or the pit or the bottomless pit or the abusus. And so we got into a, <laughs> we got into a great conversation last week. And, um, and so we talked quite a bit, didn't get very far. Um, and so let me, if I may, jump into it this morning. Uh, and this morning I really want to push your thinking out a little bit. I wish we had a live audience this morning, um, but let me, let me, if I might, challenge your thinking and um, your optic, and uh, when we come back after Christmas, we'll deal with this, and I'm sure you'll have a million questions to ask when we get there. So we're talking about this particular region here, the abyss, and uh, let me, if I might, talk to you about that. Last week, we started talking about devils and demons, disembodied spirits, and that is where they belong. That is where they go to. Uh, these obviously were creatures that had a body at one stage, were disembodied, and now they seek to possess a body. Unlike angels, angels don't seek to possess a body. Angels can manifest in a body. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 2, sometimes we can even entertain angels unawares. They just look like us. They can, they can take on a, a physical form, uh, but they don't seek to possess a body. Um, and so, but demons do. So let me take this up, if I may, and move on out of this this morning. And it says in Matthew 12, it says, And when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, and Jesus is teaching here, and he's talking about an unclean spirit, taking up this disembodied spirit, looking for a occupation in, human, in, a, in a physical body. And that can be an animal or that can be a physical body. All they want to do is, having had a physical body, and being dis disconnected from it, they now look for another physical body to carry out their passion and desire. So these spiritual entities endeavor to possess. It says, And when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dark, dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he says, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven more spirits, more wicked than himself. Again, notice they're all wicked. There's none of them nice. But these are worse, worse than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. Again, Jesus was pointing out that these entities seek to possess a, a, a physical body. And if you drive them out, and you can, and, and we should, but when the place is cleaned up and garnished and, and they're delivered, you've got to fill that place with something. You've got to give them knowledge and understanding so that they'll never open the door for that thing to enter again. But should it come back and, and, and you, they're not savvy enough, smart enough, to understand what has happened and what they've been delivered from, and they haven't filled up the... the, the the soul and having filled up their mind and renewed their thinking, he'll come back and he'll bring others with him. And if he can get back in again, he'll, he'll, he'll come in with others and make it worse than it was before. So we took this up last week in a lively discussion. Um, so let me just say this about devils and demons. They are uh, evil, intelligent, wise. They're individual, but they're also numerous. Uh, they have knowledge. They understand things. They have knowledge. They believe. They have doctrines called doctrines of devils. They have a will. They have feelings and desires. And they have personalities. Devils or demons, they are powerful. They can do miracles or seemingly miracles. And they're able to enter men and beast given the opportunity. They just can't force their way in. They've got to be invited in or allowed in. They cause blindness and dumbness and deafness and lunacy and suicide and torment and oppress and, and sickness and disease. Now, they're not the cause of all sickness or all disease. I mean, just taking a bad diet and not sleeping properly and so on and so forth can cause you to be unwell and not take care of yourself and, and not stay healthy and so on and so forth. Um, it's not necessarily a devil, uh, but you haven't said that. Um, they can do these things. Um, not everybody who's deaf or dumb uh, has a devil. However, they, they, uh, 
they, they have done this to people, but that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone that is deaf and dumb has a devil. They don't. They don't. You can have some medical issue or physical deformity or, or um, incapacity uh, that would make you blind or whatever, and it's not necessarily a devil. However, they do do that, though. They can teach. They can steal. They can deceive. They can fight. Uh, they can be familiar. And uh, they know their fate. They know where they're going. They know. They know what's what's happening. What's about to happen. They fear God, and they belong in the abyss, the abysses, or the pit, or the bottomless pit. It says, and they can be tested, and they can be resisted, they can be rejected, and they can be evicted. So these entities, you know, they, they are quite, uh, they can be quite powerful, they can be quite uh, smart, they can be quite um, intelligent, and, and they can be quite um, uh influential so but they can be they can be resisted and they can be ejected but they do endeavor to possess and control uh, and express themselves through a physical body in luke 8 and 29 it says for when he commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man for often it had caught him and had kept him bound with chains and in fetters and he broke the bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness and jesus asked him saying what is your name this is the demoniac when Jesus crossed over the lake in the, in the boat. This demoniac who was in the, in the, among the gravestones and naked and, and isolated, he came running toward Jesus and fell before him. And Jesus asked, saying, What is your name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. And they besought him that he would not commend them to go into the deep. And the word there, deep, is the abyss or abusus. They knew where they were going. They knew where they were assigned to, but they didn't want to go there yet. And so they asked Jesus to commend that they be driven into the pigs. And you know the story, and then the pigs all ran off the edge of the precipice and all drowned. But they didn't want to go to the deep because they knew that's where they were going. They knew they were going into the abusos. They knew they were going into the abyss or the bottomless pit. This is not the same place for angels. This is for devils and for demons. Over in Revelation chapter 9, we get another insight into this particular region. It says in Revelation 9 and verse 1, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven it said, onto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. This is an angel. And he opened the bottomless pit. And there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. So this bottomless pit has a shaft. This bottomless pit has a door. And this bottomless pit has a key uh, to open it. So it can, it, obviously the shaft comes up onto the, uh, onto the face of the earth, but it goes down into the abyss underneath the earth. It says, And there came out of the smoke locusts uh, upon the earth, and unto them were given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men who have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Again, I, I, I can't even begin to imagine what these creatures look like. Um, but he tries to describe them for us here. It says, and to them it was given <clears throat> that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death, and shall, shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. This is in the tribulation period, where death will flee the world for five months, but in that period of time people will want to die because of, of these creatures that come up out of the bottomless pit or out of the abusus and the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle and on their heads it, it, as it were were crowns like gold and their faces were like the faces of men and they had hair like the hair of women and their teeth were as the teeth of lions Again, I, I can't imagine. Phenomenal uh, explanation of, 
of what's going to happen during that period of time. He goes on to say, And they had brass plates, and the brass plates were of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots and of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit. So there's somebody in charge whose name is in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon. But in the Greek tongue, uh, he hath his name Apollyon. Now, he differentiates here between an angel and these devils and demons. They're not angels. Devils and demons are not angels. They're different species altogether. And they're wicked and they're evil. And as I said, they're very intelligent, smart, have doctrines, believe God, uh, believe that there is a God, shall I say. And James says that even the devils believe and tremble, believe in God and tremble. So, um, But these guys come up out of this bottomless pit. So again, uh, this region is underneath the earth. There is a shaft that comes up to the surface and there's a door and that door is locked and the guy with the key to this is an angel called Apollyon or Abaddon. In Revelation, the 17th chapter in verse 8, it says, The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. And they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Again, the Antichrist and these characters that are going to be around in the tribulation, great tribulation period, they're going to have their origin out of the pit, out of, out of the abusus. And um, so again, if I had a live audience, I'm sure I'd have a million questions at this stage. But we'll take this up again when I come back. So again, we have these regions. We have the grave, which is one region. We have um, Shoal or Hades, um, which is in two uh, levels, an upper and a lower region. Uh, one was called Abraham's bosom in the Old Testament, and the bottom place was a place of torment and fire, and Jesus is, describes that in Luke 16. Then we have um, the third place, which is Tartarus, and the, uh, sorry, we have the fourth place, which is Tartarus, and the fifth place, which is the abyss. Again, the grave, the upper region of Shoal, the lower region of Shoal, Tartarus and the abyss. These are the five regions underneath the earth. Now, we went to all of that um, detail because we wanted to understand what happened to Jesus for the three days and the three nights, because that's really what we've been talking about, the hypostatic union and the Lord Jesus coming down to redeem man back to God, to deal with sin. And, um, and so I, I wonder if I may now to maybe take you a, and open your understanding a little bit, challenge your thinking and your optic, and, and let me uh, have a look now at where Jesus went for the three days and three nights. He died on a Wednesday afternoon, on Good Wednesday, and when he said he gave up the spirit, some people, as we dealt with, think that he went on to be with the Father and sort of stayed there for three days and three nights and then came back and pick up a resurrected body. But the Bible didn't say that. The Bible said Jesus spoke, even himself, that he would be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And so I wanted to go down in underneath the earth and show you what was there so that we can now start to decipher where Jesus went for the three days and the three nights and why. Now, in order to understand where Jesus goes and why, we got to go back to these concepts and principles. So, the cross, the physical cross, that we talk about, as believers and Christians, this the cross was dealing with man's sins. He was wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we were healed. All of this uh, that happened to him physically on the cross where he shed blood. We brought this up also a few weeks ago where Jesus shed blood on five different occasions. And again, he didn't spill blood. He did it intentionally. He, he purchased back several things with his blood um, and he did that for us in the physical arena. Um, and so the cross was dealing with sins. 
and the cross was dealing with the physical. Hell, where Jesus is going to go, his spirit is going to go, hell, he goes there to deal with sin, which is the cause of sins. Sins are the symptom, but the issue had to be dealt with, and that was not dealt with by the cross. That was dealt with in hell. So, hell is dealing with sin, singular, and hell is dealing with the spiritual aspect of man's disconnection from God. Man disconnected spiritually, and then later on the outworking of that disconnection was sins or physical death. Jesus came and he dealt with the physiology, the, the, the symptoms of sin on the cross, but he dealt with the spiritual aspect of sin in hell itself. And, I, and I'll explain and show you why when we, when we go there. And this is very important that you understand this. Jesus' body did go to the tomb and went to the grave, but his, his spirit went down into the lower regions of the earth. In, in the suffering on the cross, Jesus was purchasing for us a, a victory so that we could live victoriously in our physical world. Um, but he, he, he was going to go down into the underworld to deal with our spirituality. And, and there is a difference, and I'll show you why. There are three psalms, or three scriptures that I would encourage you to read between now and we get back together. Psalm 22, which we did read a few weeks ago, um, was his physical suffering. These are messianic psalms and, and, and prophecies. And in Psalm 22, it starts off, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Which Jesus recited when he was on the cross. And then it finished Psalm 22 with, It is finished. Of course, again, Jesus recited that when he was on the cross. And so as you read through Psalm 22, we see uh, the physical sufferings and how Jesus felt as he hung on, on the cross. And he was dealing with physical suffering. When we go to Isaiah in chapter 53, we start to, again, read about his physical sufferings on the cross, but then it transitions into spiritual suffering. Because those two sides to this um, aspect of redemption, physical and spiritual. And so his physical suffering is in the first part of Isaiah 53, and then it transitions into spiritual suffering. And now when he's down in spiritual suffering, Psalm 88 deals with his spiritual suffering and anguish. And again, I would encourage you to read these slowly, carefully, and uh, grasp the concept and listen. And then... Um, we we'll just, we, you know, we, I think we'll have a, a ton of questions when we get back together after Christmas. So, um, let me go back and deal then with, with the physical and then the transition into the spiritual and why they're different. In 1 Corinthians 2, it says, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The people who brought the pain and suffering upon Jesus on the cross were the princes of this world, the spiritual wickedness in, dark, in, in, in uh, heavenly places, uh, devils and demons, and man, or, or through man, the devil done it. But the Bible says here, if the princes hadn't known what they were doing, they would never have done it. They didn't realize they were being set up for their own defeat. But the people who crucified Jesus, the people who, who brought the suffering on Jesus was not God the Father. God the Father did not bring that suffering on him. It was the principalities and the spiritual wickedness in high places. It was the devil and it was humanity. They were the ones that brought that suffering upon him. But the Father didn't. The Father is going to deal with with the sin issue, but that's going to be a much more intense issue. The reason Jesus went to the cross to deal with these issues was for me and for you. 
he was going to purchase a victory for us in the physical arena. He was going to purchase a victory for us in our physical lives over principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places and the rulers of the darkness of this world. In this physical world, as we were to live out our Christian walk for those who had put their trust in Jesus, he was going to purchase for us healing and well-being and victory so that we could live victoriously and reign in life in this natural life by one Christ Jesus. Now, Jesus didn't need to defeat the devil because the devil was already defeated. The, Jesus had no problem with the devil. Um, the devil was, was, had no power over Jesus. Jesus succumbs to all of this, not because he needed a victory over the devil. Jesus succumbed to all this because we needed a victory over the devil. We needed a victory over sickness and disease. We needed the victory over torment. We needed the victory over fear and anguish and all of these different things. We needed the victory. Jesus didn't. So for him to go here and to suffer the affliction from this, from this quarter was to purchase a victory for us, not for himself. It says it this way in Colossians 2 and verse 13. Speaking of me and you, when you were stuck in your old sin-dead life, you were incapable of responding to God. This is true. God brought you alive right along with Christ. Think of it. All sins forgiven. S-I-N-S. -S. The slate wiped clean. That old arrest warrant cancelled and nailed to Christ's cross. He stripped all the spiritual tyrants in the universe of their sham authority at the cross and marched them naked through the streets. That's from the Message Bible. God hadn't afflicted Jesus at this stage. But the devil and the consequence of sin and his um, usurping his authority over Adam and the consequences that came because of the fall in the physical man, um, Jesus went after that. He went after that handwriting that, that was opposed to us that we couldn't keep and the consequences of which we were suffering in our physical world and, and being um, uh, carried out by um, and uh, done by or um, I'm, I'm trying to think of the word, um, served to us by principalities and, and powers because of, of, of our uh, unrighteousness. And so Jesus dealt with that and he took all of that was against us physically in, in, in that spiritual arena that, that was in this world and he defeated them. He didn't do it for him. He did it for me and you so that we could live a victorious life here physically and spiritually in the world. The Amplified Bible says it this way. And you who were dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, your sensuality, your sinful carnal nature, God brought to life together with Christ, having freely forgiven us all our transgressions having cancelled and blotted out and wiped away the handwriting of the note or the bond with its legal decrees and demands which were in force and stood against us, hostile to us. This note with its regulation decrees and its demands he set aside and cleared completely out of our way by nailing it to the cross. This is what he was doing when he went to the cross. He took all of these um, legalities that had come because of sin and now were, were the consequences of sins and Jesus dealt with it. He gave us a victory over these things and over the ones who enforce it. God disarmed the principalities and the powers that were uh, ranged against us and made a bold display and public example of them in triumphing over them in him and is sorry and in it the cross so that's what the cross was about God wasn't putting that on Jesus 
That was man. That was the principalities. And again, had they have known what they were doing, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. But they sort of just got the opportunity and he laid down his, uh, his guard for the moment that it was and, and took upon, they, they heaped on him all the consequence of Adam's sins, S-I-N-S. And so in his physiology, uh, and because these devils are the ones who enforce it, Jesus got a victory, not because he needed one, but because we needed one. It says in Ephesians, I hit the wrong button there, it says, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. See, this is where our physical battle and spiritual battles are here in the earth. And when Jesus went to the cross, he took them on. He took on all the consequence of what these entities can do and, and do do and, uh, and dealt with it and all the consequence of S-I-N-S. And he dealt with it. So we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now you've got to understand, that's what was going on on the cross. Jesus could have went straight down into the underworld, basically died and went down into the underworld and suffered the wrath of God. Because that's what the, that was the price that was necessary to redeem man from S-I-N, sin, the original problem, not the S-I-N-S. The S-I-N-S were dealt with on the cross, but the S-I-N, the problem, was dealt with in hell. And so the two different places. Jesus went to the cross for our S-I-N-S. And of course, the victory of the cross was not in him dying on the cross. The victory of the cross is in his resurrection. So it's not over. And the victory in hell was not because he went to hell, but because he rose again from hell and triumphed over hell and death in the resurrection. And so the resurrection is what seals both the solution for S-I-N-S and S-I-N, but they're both dealt with in two arenas here. Jesus dealt with one in the physical arena on the cross, and then he dealt with the spiritual problem in hell itself. In John 12, 31, Jesus makes this statement. Now the judgment of this world, sorry, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Jesus wasn't afraid of the devil or demons or whatever. He did not have to get a victory over them. He was already, a, as, the, as the last Adam, walking as the original Adam was intended to, he walked in triumph over these entities and these creatures. They couldn't find any place in him. He goes on in John 14, 30, and he says, Hereafter I will not talk much unto you, for the prince of this world cometh, and has nothing in me. So when you see Jesus on the cross, he's going through that for a reason. Not because he needed the victory over the devil and principalities. Not because he needed the victory over the consequence of S-I-N-S. But he purchased for me, for you and all of us who would believe, he purchased for us by shedding his blood and the resurrection of the dead which enforced it, he purchased for us victory over these entities while we're here in this world as we wrestle them, as we engage them, as they try to inflict and usurp uh, Adam's fall into the world in which we live. Uh, we rule and reign over them in this physical world and that's what Jesus was doing when he went to the cross. But when the cross was over and he physically died and had paid that price to, to purchase that, he went down into the lower parts of the earth for the purpose of dealing with the spiritual aspect or the original problem, which is S-I-N. And that needed to be dealt with because the punishment for that was the wrath of God. The wrath of God was not on Jesus on the cross. The wrath of spiritual entities and the wrath of man was upon Jesus on the cross. But the wrath of God was something that Jesus had to encounter in hell itself. The cross was dealing with the physical arena and principalities. That's what that was all about. That's why. But the cross wasn't dealing with the spiritual aspect. 
It was dealing with all the consequence of S-I-N-S. In 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 23, there are two elements or emblems in the in the communion table. One is physical, represents physiology, one represents spirituality. And maybe you never thought of it. For Paul says, I received of the Lord that which I was delivered on to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This again is reflection, reflective of the cross. This is that victory over the devil. This is that victory over principalities and the spiritual wickedness in high places. This is the victory uh, uh, over sickness and disease so that we can walk in health and reign in life by one Christ Jesus. That's why his body was broken. That was something he paid for for you and me to enable and empower us in this physical life to live victoriously. Physically. Then it goes on to say in verse 25, And after the same manner, he took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This is a covenant. And this is a completely different level of sacrifice. One was physical, the other one is spiritual. And he says, This is my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show or proclaim or declare the Lord's death or his victory for us until he comes back. And then he goes on to say, when you eat and drink this thing and you, and, and you do it flippantly and you miss the essence of what he done for us, not for wonder some people are sick and have even died. And so again, these two emblems speak of the physical part of this uh, redemp this this uh, redemption, which was for S I N S on the cross, and the covenant part of our deliverance and our redemption uh, as an S I N by this blood covenant. Again, two elements uh, uh, depicting the physical, the cross, and the spiritual, which was when he went down into hell itself. Uh, defeating the devil was for our physical victories and healing. That's what it was for. In the natural life. That's why he did that. He didn't just go down and, and pay the price for us to be born again and so that we could be seated in heavenly places in Christ. He knew we had to live down here as the church and we still had to engage and wrestle these principalities and there was still an aspect of our makeup that was still physical Although it's been redeemed, spirit, soul, and body, your spirit is is sealed and, and, and righteous. Your mind is renewed, but your physical body, you have to get a new one, a glorified body later on. So he knew that we would be in this position, but he won for us a victory, and that's why he did what he did. So defeating the devil was for our physical victories and healing in the natural life. Seating us with himself in heaven was for our spiritual placement in righteousness having everlasting life it's a completely different um, purchase one dealt with the devil one dealt with the outworking of sins here in the world but the other spiritual one in, enabled us to sit in christ at the right hand of the Father, in heavenly places, and then, of course, because of that position, far above all principalities, powers, might. Spiritually, we're far above them, but physically, we got to deal with them here on the earth and wrestle with them. So one aspect of Jesus' sacrifice was physical, and the other part was spiritual. The physical one was dealt with on the cross. The spiritual one is going to be dealt with in the bowels of the earth. And it's a different level of suffering and a different level of punishment. And, and, and the one in, in, in the lower parts of the earth is comes upon him by God, whereas the one on the earth came upon him by principalities and powers and, and men. So two different arenas, two levels of wrath. One was the wrath of men and, and devils and demons. The other is the wrath of God, a completely different level of justice. Isaiah 53, 
here's the here's this transition from the physical into the spiritual he is despised and rejected of men well let, let me go back to this for a minute let me just excuse me let me just remind you too jesus in john the sixth chapter when he was um talking to the crowd he says unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood do you remember that whole story and they couldn't grasp it i mean they just they they they, they just couldn't believe he had said such a thing it sounded like cannibalism which was against the word of god but that's not what he was saying he was he, his words were spiritual and truth and he goes on to say that later on when everybody walks away he says the words they speak on to you they are spirit and their life but what he was saying to them was unless you participate and understand what i'm doing and and you eat my body and drink my blood or in other words you participate in my victory over these entities in the physical aspects of sins uh, in the world and then participate in the covenant which deals with sin and makes you righteous and exalts you and seats you in heavenly places in christ both of them he says you, you can't participate with me because that's what i've come to do so Again, in Isaiah 53, in verse 3, he is despised and rejected of men. This was when men were putting this wrath upon him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. And he and he was only acquainted with it, not because he didn't deserve it, but he, he, he was introduced to it. Hello, sir, here's, here's grief, here's suffering, here's sickness, here's disease, here's torment, here's fear, here's depression, here's all sorts of manner and all manner of... of uh, unwellness and and so on and so forth and and he was acquainted with it but it wasn't his it was ours it goes on to say he was acquainted with grief and we he doesn't wear our faces from him he was despised and we esteemed him not we hid our faces from him man did because man thought god was judging him because he did something wrong what we failed to understand was God wasn't judging him on the cross. He was just volunteering to pay the price on the cross for all of the consequences of our SINS. And the devil gladly facilitated it. And so we esteemed him not because we thought God was punishing him, but it wasn't God that was punishing him. God's going to punish him later. It wasn't God that was punishing him. It was the devil and the principalities, and it was us, man. We were the ones who put him there. It goes on to say, surely he had borne our sicknesses and carried our sorrows. And we did esteem him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. We thought that he did something wrong, but what we were actually looking at on the cross was what we did wrong. He was doing that for me and you. It wasn't his wrongness he was paying for. It wasn't his wrongness he was fighting for. It was my wrongness and your wrongness. And the consequence of S-I-N and the outworking of that is S-I-N-S, which brought along all the aspects of death in our physical world. Spiritual death and physical death. So he was dealing with the physical aspects of death. He was wounded for our transgressions. This happened for us. He was bruised for our iniquities or our inadequacies and shortcomings. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we were healed. All of this happened on the cross. But now we see the transition because it transitions now into the lower parts of the earth because there's two aspects to this sacrifice. It goes on, verse 6. And all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord laid on him. Now the Lord is doing this. Back here, we were doing it. The devil was doing it. Principalities were doing it. If they hadn't known what they were doing, they would never have done it. They were setting themselves up for a defeat. Men put them up there. In fact, a, a, over in the book of, of Acts in chapter 2, Peter accused them, the, the, the people standing before him on the day of Pentecost, he said, you crucify the Lord of glory. Speaking to, to, to men. And they did do it. But they were the outworking and, and the tool that the devil was doing to try and get rid of him. And so, um, anyway, here's the transition. It says, All we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord, now the, the onus and the emphasis changes. Now the Lord is going to start dealing with him. Not on the cross. Jesus did that for you and me. 
That was, that was, he did that for us. But here now he's going to deal with the wrath of God. He's going to deal with God's just and justice and judgment over SIN. Because it had to be paid for. So it says here, we like sheep have gone astray and have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord laid on him. Now the Lord's dealing with it. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison, from judgment. Who shall declare his generation? For he was cut out of the land of the living. This is when he died. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. Now there's a different level of of um, suffering going on now. He's been the Lord is laying on him the iniquity of all mankind, and the Lord now is, is striking him in his righteous justice for sin. Somebody got to pay for it for what Adam done. In Isaiah fifty three and verse nine it goes on to say, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. And the word there is plural, deaths, the e a t h s. it's plural. Two deaths, spiritual and physical, physical and spiritual. Because he hath done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth, he, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. God, God was delighted to have somebody to, to, to carry this thing. It pleased the Lord. Our Heavenly Father had somebody that would now pay the price. Somebody who would now take the, the righteous justice of God and, and carry the consequence of S-I-N. So it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. This is the Lord doing this. This is not principalities. Can you imagine the difference? This is not uh, devils and demons and men. This is God. And it's a different level of anguish, a different level of, of being smitten. It's a different level of judgment and punishment. This is the wrath of God upon S-I-N. Again, I'll read it again. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. The Lord's doing this. When thou hast made his soul, not his body, his soul an offering for sin, S-I-N, he shall see his seed and shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Or God's plan is being outworked now through Jesus. This was God's plan. This was God's intent was to fix this thing. Now God's able to do it by bringing his, his righteous justice and wrath upon Jesus on our behalf for SIN. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many and he shall bear their iniquities verse 12 therefore i will divide him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he hath poured out his soul unto death he was numbered with the transgressors and he shall bear the sins of many and make intercession for the transgressors. Again, he poured out his soul onto death. This was spiritual. And we'll take this up when we get together next time and we'll have this discussion and, and open it up. Now, let me go to one more verse of scripture just that I'm thinking of it. Just give you something to read and something to think and talk about. Uh, over the Christmas period, um, over in Le uh, sorry in Leviticus chapter sixteen. Now remember this: over in Matthew the fifth chapter and verse seventeen, Jesus said he came to fulfill every jot and tittle. In the Old Testament, every sacrifice and every offering and every ceremony and every ritual were types, shadows of the real that was to come. And so when Jesus said he came to fulfill every jot and tittle, I mean down to the last dot over the I and the comma at the end of the sentence. And so everything that you read in the Old Testament, all these sacrifices and, and, and um, festivals and 
rituals uh, are a, a picture of what was going on. And I want us to go back to Leviticus, the 16th chapter. And I want to read to you there just this portion. I didn't put it in, but I just thought I'd do it now that I have time. Leviticus, the 16th chapter. And here we're going to deal with the atonement. And let me read some things that are interesting. And again, when we get back together after Christmas, we'll take this up and have a discussion on it, I'm sure. It goes on here to say in, in chapter 16 and verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses after the death of his two, the two sons of Aaron, when they had offered before the Lord and died. And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, so that he won't die. For I will appear in a cloud upon the mercy seat. Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. And he shall put on the holy linen coat uh, which he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh. And he shall be girded with a linen girdle and with a linen mitre shall he be attired. And these are holy garments. Therefore he shall he wash his flesh in water and put them on. So this guy, Aaron, cannot go in now whenever he wants. God's put a restriction on it. He says, you can't come in here now whenever you want. You've got to come now from here on in a special way. And the only person who can do that is Aaron. And then he's got to wash himself, dress correctly, bring an offering for himself, a bullock and a goat, and offer them as a sin offering for his own sins to make him uh, acceptable to God to do what he's about to do, which is to make an atonement for the people. He goes on here to say in verse 5, He shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. So he takes two goats here. One is for, um, he says here, one is for a sin offering and the other one is for a burnt offering. Let's, let's go on. And Aaron shall offer his bullock for this sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his own personal family. Verse 7. And he shall take two goats, two of them, and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. I'll bring this all up when we talk the next time. Two goats. One is for God and the other is the scapegoat. And read on. Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall he present alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him. There's two goats. One's going to be offered up physically uh, and the other one is going to make the atonement, the live one. Not the dead one. The live one makes the atonement. Let me read that again. Verse 8. Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. The atonement actually was carried out by a goat who went alive into the wilderness, into the barren places. Not the dead one. There was two. One died and the other went off into the into the into the dry places, the wilderness, as a scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and shall make an atonement for himself and for his house, and shall kill the bullock and the sin offering, which is for himself. You all still with me? All right. 
And then he goes on here to talk about how he does that. He takes the, the blood and he sprinkles it on the on the horns of the altar and the door. And he, he's, he's purchasing, walk, cleansing everything with the blood of this particular offering. So then it goes on here to say, um, I, I'll read it. I'll read verse 12. I might as well just read it through and then you can we'll jump the hurdle next, next time we're together. Verse 12, he shall take the censer full of burning coals from off of the fire of the altar before the Lord and his hands full of sweet incense, beaten small, and bring it within the veil. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord and that cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he doesn't die. So he does this for himself. He shall take the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward and before the mercy seat he shall sprinkle the blood with his finger seven times. So he'll do that. Then, watch, shall he kill the goat of the sin offering. There's these two goats, one's for the Lord, a sin offering. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, that is for the people, and bring his blood within the veil, and do that blood, do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat before the mercy seat. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel. So he's, he's cleaning everything, all the implements and the tabernacle itself with this particular sin offering. It goes on to say, He shall do this for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when, this, when he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place until he comes out, until he has made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. And when he shall go out into the altar that is before the Lord, and make an atonement for it. He's making an atonement for the altar now, remember. He shall take the blood of the bullock and the blood of the goat and put it upon the horns of the altar round about and he shall sprinkle the blood upon it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and hollow it for the uncleanness of the children of Israel. So he's cleaning all the implements and the, the altar of incense. He's cleaning not just for his own sin. He did it for his own sin so he could serve at these things. But now he's doing it for the, the people because of their uncleanness. Now, verse 20. And when he has made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat, not the dead one, the live one. And Aaron shall lay his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions in all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat and he shall send him away by the hand of a fit man or a fit runner into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities onto a land not inhabited. And he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. Now, let's stop there. All of this is a type of the Lord Jesus, not just physically dying, which was that first sacrifice, to pay the price for the uncleanness of the people in the altar. He did the cross for us and our uncleanness to give us victory so we could rule and reign in life by one Christ Jesus. And those the blood was shed for those reasons. But the scapegoat, the second goat, doesn't die. He goes alive into the wilderness or into the dry places, is another terminology, which is a type of Jesus after his physical death and his body going to the grave and an offering for SINS through his physiology now goes down into the bowels of the earth to the, the innermost dungeons of hell to bear the iniquities of all of the people all of human, humans SIN to deal with that and it's a type of taking him off into the wilderness, into the dry place, uh, as the scapegoat. The scapegoat is the one that bought our atonement, and he didn't die. He went off into the barren places. But this is a type of Jesus who goes into 
the lower regions of the earth to pay the consequence for our SIN. And we'll take that up the next time we're all together. Um, I hope that stretches your thinking a little bit. hope that changes your optic a little bit. I hope you listen to it again and maybe get your thinking in, uh, around that because there's more to it. you got to listen to it a few times and you got to think about it a lot. Um, and again, as I said, when we come back in the new year, we'll take this up. I'll have a live audience and I'm no doubt that you'll have a million questions to ask and talk about. But we, we, we've still a lot to do. Um, until then, I wish you all a very Merry Christmas with your family and all those that you love and love you. And, uh, and I wish you a very hope-filled and prosperous and exciting new year to come. 2021 is our best year yet. The scriptures tell us as a believer we go from glory to glory. We go from strength to strength and the light of a righteous man and woman burns brighter and brighter. So our next year is going to be our best year. It truly is. In spite of and regardless of what 2020 has dealt out to the, the globe. I thank God for what we've done in Bible Optics. I'm glad we were able to keep our focus on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And I know there's been a lot of negative things that have happened throughout the year, socially. and um, But I think we at Bible Optics have all been encouraged. I think we've learned a lot. I think we've, uh, we're encouraged a lot. I think we're inspired a lot to want to spend more time in the Word and develop ourselves and our walk with God. And so that's been a good thing in 2020. And I believe 2021 will be an even better year for all of us. So until I meet with you on the far side of the new year, be blessed, be encouraged, and wherever you go in life and over this Christmas time, endeavor to live a life as a witness and a testimony of the wonderful benefits of so great a salvation.